And a kurtosis is related to a histogram in that uh, you calculate the kurtosis after doing a histogram. So let's say I have some data and I'm going to draw on the slides. I really enjoy drawing on them. So this is just some data versus time and there's some different uh, amplitude values here. We can break up the Y scale into a few different what we call bins or you know data values like this first one goes from zero to one then one to two then three to four and so uh, and i can assign a like an average amplitude or whatever to these uh bins of course i'm calling it a bin but here on the slide it's calling it a class so a bin or a class basically we're breaking up the amplitude of the y-axis into discrete intervals. And then we just count the number of data points in each uh, interval. So if I was to count up along this axis, Charles, how many data points fall in the first bin or class? Looks like there's one. Yeah, I think you're right. So we got uh, a value of one for this. Uh, the next bin looks like there might be a few more. What's your guess? I'm gonna go with five. I like your guess. So five, and we just throw that over here. And then we do the same for the remaining bins. And uh, there we have the amplitude distribution of our data. So this is known as a histogram. And depending on the type of signal, we might have different types of distributions for our data. For example, if I had something like this uh, square wave here, Charles, I'll count up the first bin. So how many data points there? Eight, I guess. Yeah. Eight or so. Eight, yeah. yeah, sounds good. And then along this one? That's zero. It's going to be zero. And, you know, of course, we put a zero in our graphic, even though. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we got uh, another zero here, and then we got uh, eight okay. again. So what's that uh, distribution kind of uh, look like, Charles? Uh, I don't know exactly. Do you know, do you know this simple, Charles? Rock on? Is that it? <laughs> I don't know. If, if you're from Texas, it's the Texas Longhorn symbol, something like that. Just oh, okay. Near gotcha. here. <laughs> Wait, it would be easier to do, do that. So, yeah, we got uh, a distribution that looks like this. If you had a distribution like of a, a sine wave, for example, so if I had a sine wave here instead, it would be pretty similar, wouldn't you say? Maybe a few more points along the edges yeah but yeah we're talking about a signal that i, I don't know we, we cover the terms later on but we have uh, a lot of data at the extremes very little data in the center right yeah. that kind of make makes yeah. sense to you makes sense all right so i was talking about going over bumps or you know, having clicking sounds or something like that does this kind of look like what a clicking sound might look like in the time domain yeah, very transient. Yeah, and this would have a very particular distribution as well. If I was to count up the data points here, we got our zero that, I don't know, something symbolizes zero. Then how about here? We got a ton of data points, right? Yeah. Then here, just a few, and then here, just a few. So uh, instead of the uh, Texas Longhorn symbol, Charles, what does that distribution look like? The one that's on the screen right now? Yeah. Uh, I, I can describe it with my fingers. <laughs> Just not the Texas Longhorn no. again? <laughs> That's, yeah, he lost a horn. But anyway, yeah, I think yeah. Of a very distinct histogram that uh, is. Sure, really, sure. Yeah, it's also kind of symbolic. So there, all the data is concentrated in a, a small area, right? Of uh, uh, or in the, the center bins and not at the extremes. So that's what like a impact event looks like. And if you are doing something like an impact or a transient like this on some real data, let's say you had a microphone and you have a pretty noisy environment, but you can hear these ticks. It could be that the ticks are hard to see in the time domain. This type of distribution, be able to quantify the extremes of the data, you would, might have to apply something like a bandpass filter around the click frequency range, you know, because it might go from like a thousand to five thousand hertz, some kind of broadband response, and get rid of any frequencies that are really low that are interfering with seeing it in the time domain. So 
If you're going to use something like a histogram to quantify things like a transient, you better see a transient in the time domain. Uh, if I had something purely random, Gaussian random signal, it's going to look uh, look like this. Um, and well, if I had used enough bins, it would really look like this. So it'd be a bell-shaped curve. I have those signals here. Uh, I have a uh, just to give you an idea of what this looks like in practice. If you're, I got a uh, random signal square wave so if i zoom in a bit here and maybe make that a little bit thicker so you can see it you know got a nice square wave and then we have a, a transient event mm -hmm. so from memory do you remember what should the random signal look like from a histogram point of view a bell-shaped curve bell-shaped curve yeah uh, the square wave should look like uh texas longhorns are winning <laughs> yeah and then the blue one should have everything around the. We're number system. one. That's what it stands for. We're number. Oh, one. we're number one. Oh, that's we're number better. one. Yes, yeah. I have to. I just have to think about it for a second. But yeah, <laughs> that's what it means. And if you're using the software, you'll find things like histogram here in the uh, data calculator. So if you click over here in the navigator, you can calculate a histogram. The histogram here it is. We got the red is the bell-shaped curve. Green is our Texas Longhorns, and then blue is our impact event. If I go back here, the term kurtosis actually looks at this histogram. This is the formula for it, and you apply it to this distribution of data. If you had these three signals that we just talked about, what's interesting is with the equation, and notice there's this minus three here. If we have the minus three, this Gaussian random signal will be equal to a kurtosis value of zero. So it's a way of looking at this distribution of data, all the different data values, and coming up with one number to describe the distribution. If you had a Gaussian random signal and it came up with a value for the random of three, then you're not using this minus three in the formula. So there's if you look online, you'll see there's a kurtosis value and a kurtosis XS, XS, e -X -C -E -S -S value. One has the minus three, one doesn't. So if you're not sure if you have a measurement system or something like that that can calculate kurtosis, uh, you can always double check which formula it's using uh, by putting this Gaussian random signal in and seeing if you get three or a zero, depending on the system. So Zero is kind of like a demarcation line. On one side, we got negative values. On the other side, we have positive values. And indeed, for a square wave or a sine wave, I guess you could, uh, these are always values less than zero. So it'll be a negative value. And then for an impact uh, event, where you have all these data points concentrated in one uh, bin, you're going to end up with a, a value that's greater than zero. So if I was to go in here and go back to the software for a second, and so here I have my histogram values, but if I look at the kurtosis value, and I'll point out where this is done in the software, I think, just to, so when you're in throughput processing, you have this thing called frame statistics, you can calculate kurtosis. And notice we try and tell you if it's the ex excess value or not. Um, so this can you can calculate it versus time or uh, get a single number or whatever you want to do. So the random curve, what value was it supposed to produce? Zero. Yep. So you can see it's very close to zero. It's not quite zero because it's random. So, but it varies around uh, zero here. Yeah. And then for our square wave, it's actually a very distinct value. It's negative two. It's a negative value and it's negative two. So. A square wave always has a value of negative two. I think a sine wave has a certain negative value. I can't remember it off the top of my uh, head. The impacts that we saw. So if we look back here, we can see there was one, two, three, four, five impacts. We can also calculate that as a function of time. And we're doing a, a small, you know, I can kind of simulate it here with a, a double X value or double X cursor. We're, we go through the signal and we just grab a small frame of data. That's why it's called frame statistics and calculate the value over that uh, frame of data. So as I 
really we would be going through on this data here, right? And we would have this value. So we'd go along, and then we'd hit that uh, impact, keep calculating the kurtosis, and then to show that as a function of time. And you can see here we have uh, five different peak values for the kurtosis of, of those five impacts, right? And so the kurtosis, it actually goes way positive when you have a transient event. And in fact, the more transient it is, so the clickier a click is, the more the, like if I was to do a clack versus a click, and the click being very short duration, there's more data values close to zero, the more positive it gets. And uh, you can use this, like if you're interested in understanding of how clicky or high frequency uh, a click is, the higher the kurtosis value, the more positive uh, the kurtosis value is, or the, the more short in duration the click is as well.